everybody, Peter here with Moonshots and WTF just happened this week in technology with Celine Ismail. You know, I'm constantly saying I don't watch the news, but this is the news I do watch. It's what's happening technology and a lot's just happened this week. So strap in, get ready and let's jump in. There's about 500 trillion worth of wealth in the world. And I don't see why Bitcoin can't represent more and more of that. The Bitcoin breakout. It boomed today. Bitcoin crosses a new all-time high. By any measure, these are the most successful ETF launches of all time. This is likely to go much, much higher. I think we're just at the beginning of this explosion. Everybody, Peter here. Welcome to Moonshots. I'm here with the amazing Salim Ismail, and this is WTF just happened in tech this week. Salim, so we've got a lawsuit between Elon and OpenAI. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I think uh, we're going to spend more on legal bills than we should be. Uh, and we should be spending it on tech instead. So as much as I think uh, Elon has every right uh, to sue, I think that, you know, he should have taken action a lot sooner than he actually is doing right now. What do you think about it? Yeah, you know, I kind of take his side a bit on this. He put, what, 50 or 100 million into OpenAI to put, create open, uh, truly open and safe AI. And it's gone 180 degrees the other direction. So if he's feeling miffed, I think he has every right to be. My challenge, my I listen, I agree with it. It's neither open nor uh, is it a nonprofit. And that was the intention. Um, but my question is, why is he taking action now? Why didn't he take action when it occurred three years ago or whenever it happened? That's a good question. I think maybe he just got, you know, his anger tends to build up over time. Uh, timing of his uh, kind of actions is never quite a perfect fit with what's actually going on. Um, I think the the ship has sailed, as you said, but I like I'm if you spent a lot of time and effort helping build something and then they went totally the opposite way, you'd be feeling pretty miffed if you were if you were him. So I totally understand the sentiment. I, I agree. I mean, I love the articles are coming out saying actually the reason Elon is doing this is he wants to know what Elia saw when they fired Sam. And they want to bring that out in the court of law. So that, that's interesting. That's very viable as well. There's definitely <laughs> something happened there that's not come yet to light, and it's worth looking into. Uh, I wish I wish I knew we have one of our alumna from Singularity University that was on the board, but I won't go there. You know, uh, you know, you and I flipped Singularity University from a nonprofit into a for profit back in the day. Yeah, um, and I disagreed with you at the time. The question I have is, um, you know, Elon suing Sam for it. Uh, not remaining a nonprofit and for it becoming uh, not open. But, you know, Grok is not open source, is it? So this is the dilemma I'm feeling right this second. There's definitely that. Um, I think if you put 100 million or whatever the number was to fund something and then it got flipped around, right? Grok is starting where it is from a private company on a private platform. Uh, I also happen to disagree quite a bit with what Elon is doing with Twitter, but there's, it's, like it's his and he can do what he wants with it. And I think he's got huge potential to do something amazing with it, as we'll cover a little later. But uh, I don't know where to fit. I could sit on either side of that uh, of that ethical debate. You know, I, I love Elon, but I got to imagine he's employing as many lawyers as he is engineers these days, given all that's going on. But let's go. let's go beyond this. So I saw this article that came out that sort of blew me away. Uh, this is Klarna, is the name of the company, announced its AI assistant that's on top of OpenAI. Uh, and the AI assistant has had 2.3 million conversations uh, as a customer chatbot. And it's doing the equivalent of 700 full-time agents. Um, I think you sent me this article. Yeah, it surfaced in our community and we kind of looked at it carefully. Now, it's a bit of a puff piece because it's self published around that, right? It's They obviously are promoting uh, and showing their first of the game. But I think it's a harbinger of things to come where there'll be, I think we'll see hundreds of these stories over the next few months as people find radical ways. You know, if you go back to our definition of an exponential organization is how do you radically drop the cost of supply, right? And, and there's a hundred ways in which AI can take a slice off the cost pie. And this is a great example. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, the idea of the old, you know, press one if you want to speak to a sales agent and so forth. I mean, the ability to actually say, listen, I bought this device. It sucks. It's not as advertised. I want a refund and then have a conversation and then actually get the refund or whatever it might be. Here's their numbers. It is more accurate in errand uh, resolution leading up to 25% drop in repeat inquiries and customers now resolve uh, their uh, their issues in two minutes compared to 11 minutes. That's pretty damn good. The part that really blew me away is that it's month one and they're already doing two thirds of their chest, right? It's not like 5% or 10%. It's like 67%. That's a pretty incredible thing in month one. That's amazing. Now, I think this is one of those where the initial call to customer services was always routing and saying, what are you interested in? And then you can route it to a more senior person, depending on the query. I think AIs are ripe to take over a lot of that. I, I wonder how this AI does on a, a deep Indian accent or British accent or German accent or Greek accent. You know, is it able to parse all of these inter, you know, these international accents? But we'll I would find hope out. so because if you're calling customer service, you kind of want that comfortable Indian accent to show that you're in the right place. <laughs> I say all that right. being Indian, so. So I saw this conversation from Jeffrey Hinton. Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Hinton is going to be uh, coming to join me at the Abundance Summit this year. And you'll be there at the Abundance Summit uh, this yeah. year. I'm uh, looking but, forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I want you to listen to this statement he makes, which kind of blows me away. And I want your opinion on it. What I want to claim is that these millions of features and billions of interactions and few features that they learn are understanding what you they're really doing these large language models they're fitting a model to data it's not the kind of model strategies you talk, thought much about until recently um it's a weird kind of model it's very big it has huge numbers of parameters but it is trying to understand these strings of discrete symbols by features and how features interact so it is a model and that's why i think these things are really understanding and one thing to remember is if you ask, well, how do we understand? Because obviously we think we understand. Um, well, many of us do anyway. Um, this is the best model we have of how we understand. So it's not like there's this weird way of understanding that these AI systems are doing. And then there's how the brain does it. The best model we have of how the brain does it is by assigning features to words and having feature interactions. And originally, this little language model was designed as a model of how people do it. So there you go. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Hinton believes that these AIs are, in fact, understanding. Uh, that's a that's a pretty bold statement because we just think of the AIs as, uh, you know, extrapolating, interpolating between stuff that we've already said. But if they're really understanding. That is a step towards sentience and consciousness. What do you think about that? Uh, so I'm, I do. I agree. It's remarkable. I agree. It maps onto how human beings do. I don't think it was a step towards sentience because I go back to the definition we argued about last time. I was, what do you mean by sentience? Right? Like a subset of consciousness is self awareness, and I look feel like I'm self aware, but my wife disagrees. So, like, where do you even start with the conversation? Um, uh, however, I do agree with the understanding part. I'd like to click on that a bit. Because, you know, if you think about all of our instincts, it's about finding signals from noise. That's everything, right? And we do it via biological substrate. Uh, but if you take the full extent, there's no reason why that substrate has to be wet biological. It could be anything, uh, as long as the functionality is there. So if you take it to the full extent, we're, we're uh, uh, biological robots. Every emotion in your brain is a subroutine. And so if you run that model and come out from that perspective, this is completely not surprising and un unexpected to have happen. This way, you know, if you think about genetic algorithms, they do the same thing. They, they, they're they tuned and then they learn by themselves and they're, they're adaptively learning. So I think this is a natural function that we expect to see a lot of. I think what's surprising is how good they are, how quickly they are, because that's the part that I found most fascinating when you talk to the founders, Imad mm -hmm. and others of these LLMs. They're blown away by how good they are. Yeah, I mean, we are just complicated machines at the final result, as much as as much as people like to believe something else. So the question is, if complexity gets high enough, um, 
Now, the interesting thing is going to be whether or not these large AI models start finding insights beyond humans, right? In other words, determining new physics, determining new chemistry, or new insights into biology. I, I absolutely expect that to happen because they're going to be better at signal to noise than anything that we're focused on, right? Because remember, again, all of our functionality for 4 billion years of evolution is how to survive and procreate. So what happens? What happens when when an AI model um, says you know comes up with a brand new material, a room temperature superconductor, and it's been invented? Who owns it? That's going to be interesting. That's going to be a very interesting question. It's whoever owns the robot, and at some point the robot's going to go. I want to be my own person. Yeah, but the robot right now, the AI algorithm is let's let's say it's GPT five, um, but it's my data, but OpenAI and Microsoft say no, no. It was it was created on our construct on our on our platform? Um, and you know, one I'll give you one idea that I'm thinking about, uh, and this is a freebie to any any dictator or president of any country out there. Why don't you pass the laws that allow an AI to incorporate a corporation on its own without human involvement in your country, and then we'll start to see AIs incorporating and creating businesses in your country. And, uh, you know, if you just say you can own it, but you have to pay taxes, I think that would be fascinating. That would be fascinating. I think we're going to have a tough time preaching into that model. We're somewhat close to that in the US with LLCs because lots of um, small companies get created as shell companies, et cetera. But I think that's a great, that's a great comment. And I think that'll be a hurdle if we can overcome or when we overcome, whoever does it is going to find a, a whole brave new world. I think we're going to see, you know, my prediction here, uh, we're in 2024. I think within the next four years, by 2028, we'll see some government allowing full incorporation ownership by an AI of a company that it owns and operates. You know what? I think it may, but they're going to they're gonna want the human accountability at some level. They want someone to point the finger at. That's right. They're they're going to want to go on. To, that's that's the part where it'll become interesting. By the way, can I make a comment about Jeffrey for a second? Yeah, sure. Back in 2017 in Toronto, he gave a talk at a, an event, and I went up to him and I talked to him and I asked him, you know, where are we in the spectrum of deep learning? And he said we've we've kind of come to the ends of the limitations and that we're kind of reaching the life cycle and of deep learning. We need the next breakthrough to take AI to the next level. And I said, what, what do you think that would be? And he goes, I have no idea. And literally three months later, the uh, Transformer paper was launched, right? I'm curious, when you have him there, you should ask him, what's the next step? W or when do you see the life cycle of LLMs ending? That'd be a great question. Well, you'll be, you'll be there. Help me ask him. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask him. Everyone, it's Peter. In a few weeks, I'm gathering an incredible group of AI leaders including Ray Kurzweil, Eric Schmidt, Mustafa Suleiman, Imad Mustak, Michael Saylor, and others at my private Abundance Summit to discuss the impact of AI on our lives, our businesses, and the world. The Abundance Summit is a private community open to extraordinary moonshot entrepreneurs. It's Singularity University's highest level program, and it's not for everyone. If you're at the top of your game and you want to learn more about this program, click on the link below to be considered. Okay, let's go back to the episode. Enjoy. All right, uh, let's move on to the to the next interesting article here, um, which is uh, a comment by Elon. Let's take a listen. What I'm seeing in terms of AI compute is I, I've never seen any technology advance faster than this. The, the artificial intelligence compute coming online appears to be increasing by a factor of 10 every six months. Like obviously that cannot continue at such a high rate for forever or, or it will exceed the mass of the universe, but I've never seen anything like it. And this is why you see NVIDIA's market cap being so gigantic because they currently have the best neural net chips. I mean, I think the didn't NVIDIA's market cap exceed the GDP of Canada or something recently and it was quite high. So yeah. You know, it, it may go higher, who knows? The chip rush is bigger than any gold rush. We really are on the edge of 
probably the biggest technology revolution that has ever existed. You know, there's supposedly a sort of a Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Well, we live in the most interesting of times, the most interesting. So 10x compute increase every six months. Um, talk about super exponentials. And we haven't even seen quantum hit yet. It's uh, it's off the charts. Um, I think there's a it's I think it's a gold rush. I think I don't think this continues. I give it about a one year to eighteen month cycle while we flush out this wave, um, and then it'll be it'll stabilize for a bit, or people will start. You know, the problem is when you're growing this fast, you don't consolidate, right? And and therefore, uh, you risk kind of growing so fast that you get to a point where the whole thing collapses and nobody knows what to do with it. So I think it's important in growth phases like this to take checkpoints and go, okay, let's stabilize for a bit. You, stock markets always have this pattern of growing, then stabilizing, growing and stabilizing or whatever. We're going to need to see something like that. And I think it'll naturally happen. But there's no question this completely exploding right now. Yeah, I... I, I think I think we're just at the beginning of this explosion, um, and again, what we what we haven't had before, and we have now for the first time, is self improving systems. Um, yeah, right. So with a feedback a, loop, AI, and these... AI coding, AI, and increasing. I mean, there will be a point at which uh, you want the next generation of chips. Fantastic. What am I going to go to help me design it? I'm going to go help get an AI to help me design my next generation of chips. Of course. Yeah. I mean, this has been, this is what, what Ray Kurzweil called the law of accelerating returns, right? We've been using faster computers to build the next generation faster computers, next generation faster computers. I think computers. The, the, the point for me, the question for me will be, what do you do with all that compute power? I think the, the, the spectrum of problems uh, becomes limited over time as to what you can do with it. Like right now, there's a ton really? on video, really? there's a ton on gaming. I want to see the time when we can say, "Hey, let's solve the water scarcity problem." Yeah, but uh, I think I think that is exactly what we do we do with it. People just start dreaming bigger and bigger. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're also going to start to simulate worlds within worlds. Right? This is this is why I'm so adamant we're living in a in a simulation within a simulation within a simulation. Yeah, this is the transcension hypothesis where which answers Fermi's paradox. Why don't we see alien civilizations out there? Is because they evolve virtual reality and they go inwards. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Much as the space cadet in me is pissed off about that reality, I'm breaking out. I'm 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 taking a starship. I'm heading heading out. By the way, speaking of starship, um, you know it's interesting. In this last week, we saw uh, intuitive machines land on the moon. Amazing. Um, a private company. You know, what's what people don't realize is uh, we had 20 years ago, I got Sergey Brin and and Eric Schmidt to fund a $30 million lunar, lunar X Prize. Yeah, the Google yeah. Lunar X Prize. And we had it on the table for 10 years. We had like 28, 30 teams compete and they ran out of time. It had a 10 year horizon and no one launched by that 10 years, but four four of the those teams actually launched um there was an israeli team that launched first they got into lunar orbit but they had a software glitch and they crashed um then there was a japanese team that also crashed and then a u.s team uh that didn't quite make it they had a fuel leak and intuitive machines was the fourth and they made it they tipped over but they made it to the moon so that's cool um I think that's such a huge deal. You know, it's the first land uh, moon landing in 50 years, and it's by a private company. I think that's a big deal. I, I saw this great cartoon, and it showed, uh, uh, you know, d December 1972, right? This is the Apollo 17, the last mission on the moon. Gene Cernan, who is a dear friend, is on this mission. And um, uh, he and, and I think it was Jack Schmidt were the two lunar uh, astronauts. And they're in the the lunar buggy, and they're run, you know, bouncing around in their lunar buggy. And then you saw the intuitive machine with this little RC car toy. <laughs> you know, it was like back back fifty years ago, we were driving on the moon, having a blast, and now we're we're landing a car toy. But but it gets exponential from here. Yeah, it does. I think this uh, this the beginning. You know, for me, the date that always sticks in my mind for the space world is October thirty first, two thousand. And it's the date that the first crew lifted off for the International Space Station. 
and why I find that date interesting is from Dan Barry, is that since that date, there's always been at least one human off planet. I think it's probably it's probably at least two, but um, no, if, since that date, at yes. least somebody's there's, there's been, been off, there's off been planet. humans off planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's you know, a date. Fact. So that's the first molecules, you know, escaping off into this new world. The first lungfish moving out of the oceans onto Boom. land. Yeah. You know, what's in, what's interesting though is you, you people. The whole notion of like Falcon Nine just launched with NASA astronauts going to the space station. We had ninety Falcon. Um, we had ninety Falcon Nine launches last year. And no one thinks anything of it. It's like, oh yeah, boring. It's really becoming routine. That first it's one crazy. is always this first one is always a good one. It actually reminds me of my favorite far side cartoon where there's a fish in the water with a baseball glove bat and a ball up on dry land, and the fish is looking at the baseball and the ta- caption is great moments in evolution. Because <laughs> the fish has yes. to it's great yes, awesome. climb out. Yeah. Well, S- Starship hopefully we'll take flight soon and get to orbit. Uh, their goal at SpaceX is land Starship on the moon within two and a half years. And that's a big deal because we're then able to carry like 50 to 100 people to the lunar surface. And then we've got an economy and then we've got what I want to do, which is start my first city on the moon. So we'll get to that there some other time. You know, I want to just bounce back to Elon for a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, Balaji Srinivasan put out a great little few paragraph tweet saying, why he thinks Elon is the greatest entrepreneur ever. And it's because Elon has been uh, delivering hardware, right? Uh, um, like Tesla, SpaceX. Um, I mean, this is, do, hardware is hard. And iterating hardware and getting it to work and getting it to work elegantly at scale with a profit in a business model, unbelievable, multiple times in parallel. It's it's ridiculous. Well, it was uh, my conversation with Kathy Wood, my podcast on Moonshots that you said you were listening to. I'm not sure if you got to the part that we talked about. You know, Elon will be the first trillionaire uh, and deserves to be with everything that he's doing. Yeah, I agree. Everybody, I want to take a short break from our episode to talk about a company that's very important to me and could actually save your life or the life of someone that you love. The company is called Fountain Life. And it's a company I started years ago with Tony Robbins and a group of very talented physicians. You know, most of us don't actually know what's going on inside our body. We're all optimists. Until that day when you have a pain in your side, you go to the physician in the emergency room and they say, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have this stage three or four going on. And, you know, it didn't start that morning. It probably was a problem that's been going on for some time. But because we never look, we don't find out. So what we built at Fountain Life was the world's most advanced diagnostic centers. We have four across the US today, and we're building 20 around the world. These centers give you a full body MRI, a brain, a brain vasculature, an AI enabled coronary CT looking for soft plaque, a DEXA scan, a Grail blood cancer test, a full executive blood workup. It's the most advanced workup you'll ever receive. 150 gigabytes of data that then go to our AIs and our physicians to find any disease at the very beginning when it's solvable. You're going to find out eventually. You might as well find out when you can take action. Fountain Life also has an entire side of therapeutics. We look around the world for the most advanced therapeutics that can add 10, 20 healthy years to your life. And we provide them to you at our centers. So if this is of interest to you, please go and check it out. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. When Tony and I wrote our New York Times bestseller, Life Force, we had 30,000 people who reached out to us for Fountain Life memberships. If you go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter, we'll put you to the top of the list. Really, it's something that is, um, for me, one of the most important things I offer my entire family, the CEOs of my companies, my friends, it's a chance to really add decades onto our healthy lifespans. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. It's one of the most important things I can offer to you as one of my listeners. All right, let's go back to our episode. So uh, let's talk about AGI. Uh, here we see it, yet another prediction. Uh, this one is predicting that we will achieve, we'll reach artificial general intelligence, whatever that is, by uh the end of, well, the start of 2025, it looks like here, not the end of 2025. 
So that's interesting. Uh, it's somewhere in the next four years. Uh, now, the question is, we passed the Turing test with a whimper and a yawn, meaning no one noticed, and there's no question that we're past that. Uh, so will we notice when we reach AGI? And does anyone actually have a definition of reaching AGI? So I'll go on my standard soapbox saying we have no idea what we mean by AGI. Uh, and there's that. I, I have actually a new framing, which is, which is uh, ACS, which is artificial common sense. I think when we have common sense from a robot that can mimic a human being, that will be a big deal. Not the human beings operate off common sense a great deal. Say, but say that, say that uh, TLA again. Uh, uh, ACS, artificial common sense. Okay. And TLA is three-letter acronym, as a three-letter acronym. Um, so I think that will be the time that, you know, we, we go, fall very quickly into the language problem of what the heck do you mean by the term? And, and we're really hitting the edges of human cognition and meaning and language here because you, there's such a big uh, rat hole in just the word intelligence, right? And so it's hard. But it, there's no question. I think the way to think about it is the way we talked about it last time or the way Sam Alton puts it, which is as, if we're delivering more and more intelligence into the world, that's just a good thing. I, we'll be able I, to do I, a lot more, most, fix a lot more problems, et cetera. It, it's the most valuable thing that anyone, any country, any CEO, anybody has. Um, so here's another article that broke. And it was a whole <clears throat> conversation around AI therapists that are they're actually doing better than human therapists. Uh, have you played with one of these chatbots? Uh, I have a little bit, but that was two, three years ago. I'm curious to see where they are now. I have no question in my mind that an AI therapist is way, way better than a human therapist. No question at all. And you just have to throw it a corpus. It's not going to forget any anecdotes or things. It's going to be better analytically to figure out what state you're in then, uh, uh, especially if it gets into video micro detection of facial muscles and things like that, it's really, I think it's a game changer for, for where we go. I think we'll end up with a basket of these, uh, uh, advising like a business coach, a therapist, ma uh, ma a marital shoulder, therapist, yeah. you know, giving you advice going, you know, make sure you're, you're operating in this conversation with a little too much anger right now, back off a bit, that kind of thing. Yeah, I want my you know, Cyrano to make sure that I say the exact right thing to to my wife, right? And That's right. don't screw up. Yeah. That's right. That uh, that will be a level of high high acuity. <laughs> or for any for any spouse. Um so, you know, last week we talked about Gemini uh, you know, sort of going off the rails on image generation. What I found fascinating, so Google officially apologizes for missing the mark, but what was fascinating was Sergey Brin is back in action. Um, and, you know, I've known Sergey and, and Larry Page since 2004. And, you know, Larry's been sort of MIA, um, brilliant individual. Uh, Sergey has been seen around and was involved in, in getting Bard and, uh, and Gemini up and up operating. But he's taken more of a visible role. I saw one prediction that says, expect uh, Sergey to come back as the CEO of Google. That would be a fascinating comeback. I think, you know, it's the, we both have this strong opinion that founders are really, really powerful and important for driving culture. It's clear that Google has lost its way on the cultural side, right? After reports indicate I don't know. that it's more I mean, bureaucratic I, than most companies now. I, I have thought I have thought Sundar has done a great job. I really like Sundar a lot. Um, I mean, he's really pivoted or really built the company over the last couple of years, but Regardless, I don't understand how 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 Google makes this this radical mistake it, uh, on you know honestly it's I, with, with all these LLMs right um, uh, Meta's having the same problems it's a garbage in garbage out problem yeah the here's here's data. the here's the image you know this is uh, uh, in this image here you can see uh, you know professional American football players uh, are African American women. Uh, a group of, of people in America, the American colony are are from Asia. I didn't realize that. Um, and of course, our founding fathers. So, I, I mean, how is it that is an overcompensation for uh, for racial diversity? What's going on here? Well, I think the models are all trained. I mean, if you're on the right wing, you kind of go nuts and say, this is kind of woke gone mad uh, type chaos. 
I think it's a simple garbage in, garbage out problem. We have the same issue across every training model that we're seeing. I think we're going to end up with a synthetic data and human tuning of that data to give us full guidance on where we want things to be. And we, you're, you're going to have to expect lots of chaotic outcomes in these things. But and I mean, you all, I, you're always going to see the extremes being promoted. Yeah, you, you, it's, that's absolutely true. You're going to see the the you know the point oh one percent that they got wrong being promoted. That's right. But it's, it's like it's like the Tesla. When a Tesla catches on fire, it's national news. Right. Four hundred other cars a day are exploding, and nobody ever talks about that. So it's it's you you're always going to get this very skewed thing coming out of it just because of the novelty factor. I just think this one was an easy one not to screw up on. Uh, and it makes you wonder if you can mess up on something this obviously off, right? I mean, there are well, no less than millions of photographs of or paintings of our founding fathers or of, of American well, colonists. Well, we also have the opposite problem. Like, um, Jesus Christ would, uh, was a Middle Eastern, pretty dark colored guy. And in the all the literature for 2000 years, he's the whitest guy ever. Yeah, true. So true. And we don't talk he, about that. Nope. Uh, so here's, um, of course, what has been uh, breaking the internet this past week. It's uh, Sora. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and play the video. Everybody's seen this already. And I just, I find Sora amazing. Uh, you and I were speaking with Imad Mustak, who is the CEO of uh, Stability. And Stability is going to have their own version of this open source. I know when I first saw this come out, um, my tweet was, you know, Hollywood RIP. I mean, rest in peace. And it is, it's done. What do you think? I don't think Hollywood is done. And the reason is that when you produce a Hollywood movie, there is an unbelievable amount of effort that goes into the storytelling, the direction, the post editing, etc., which is very human creative work. I right? disagree. Oh, no, I disagree, oh, dude. We just said oh. that. We just said really? a therapist is going to be better as a computer I, I therapist. I know, I know, but hold on. Let me finish my okay, sentence at least. Okay. All right. So there's a huge amount of nuance and human art that goes into the different layers, and they all have to work very well together to produce a really great film. You may have AI producing a great scene like that, that is done very quickly and easily, but to stitch together an entire 90 minute film with the bridges, with the interstitials, with the human emotion that a director might want to have moved from one frame to the other. Just if you go back to the movie Aliens, remember the iconic part where the alien rips out of the kid, the guy's stomach, right? That that they've broken that scene down. There's an unbelievable amount of art that goes into making those interstitial uh, uh, bridges between several scenes to make it look amazing over a five to six uh, shot uh, transition. I think that's the part where AI will take a lot longer to think. So my prediction will be. It's going to take way longer for Hollywood to bite the dust than people think. Okay, what's way longer? Six months? Five years? I think ten like years? three to five years. What I think will happen, <laughs> hold on, what I think will happen was that, is that um, the it'll allow new creators uh, expression and voice in a very powerful way. And you'll have, it's like the, the AGI test that they did, that you were talking to Kathy Wood about, where a uh, low-level consultant was improved by 43% and the top-level consultants only improved by 17%. So the the newer and raw, more raw filmmakers will improve a lot, but it won't change the art of beautiful filmmaking that much. That's my prediction. Yeah, I, I've, I think we're going to see uh, an incredible revolution in a new kind of films coming out, right? Where the AI is going to create the perfect film for me. If I want the movie star Starlet to be blonde versus brunette, a version that I see is blonde. I can have my friends starring it. I can pick the role, whatever it is. It knows what I like, and it can customize it specifically to my needs. I mean, let's be clear, right? YouTube just decimated a lot of television and and Hollywood already, right? My kids. I don't know about I don't know about your son. My boys like they just that's all they watch. They would watch yeah. YouTube over uh, over TV Fortnite videos on YouTube. I mean, yeah, I mean, watching games on YouTube. Exactly. So, uh, I've had a few of my abundance members who are in the Hollywood. Like, oh my God, what do I do? Right. So this is a new tool for sure. 
But there's going to be a point in the not too distant future and whatever you call AGI, its ability to come up with incredible storyline and create a film or recreate a film, a thousand variations perfectly for me, I'm going to watch it <clears throat> and, and, and enjoy it. I'm not going to watch what some producer somewhere or director thinks I want. My AI is going to know me better than, than they do. Have I convinced you yet? No. Because it, it's it, uh, what I want or what I think, let, let's say I want to read a great detective story, okay? And AI could write a great detective story uh, um, and map it to my personal reading habits really, really well. But I actually want to read what, what Sherlock Holmes does. I want to hear what the character does, right? And therefore, you know, uh, the reason we watch let's say, uh, uh, Dune is because a great, we know great director is directing it or take, take, um, um, Blade Runner, right? It's more interesting kind of getting a glimpse into the director's mind than having it more map onto what I'm thinking. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to enable, uh, a million variation directions Boom. on That's films. That's the part. So now I think you have a hundred times more amazing directors coming to the fore because they can express themselves in the way they couldn't do before. That's where I think the real magic is going to be. You know, I was fascinated by this. Let's take a look at this uh, video. Uh, we've seen uh, variations on this, taking a still photo and animating it. It's amazing. That is magic. It's pretty incredible. I think this is the kind of thing that'll be a really big deal. And it's going to be kind of incredible if we can go to old photographs of our old, my, like my grandparents. We can. Right? Absolutely. And say, say, hey, let's have a conversation now with great grandpa. You um, know, what I just did, um, and I encourage everybody to do, is my, my mom, God bless her, love her dearly. She's 88 years old. Thank God she's in good health. And I recorded her history. My dad passed. And so when I was with her a few days ago, I said, mom, let's sit down and I want you to tell me everything you can remember about dad. Um, and I'm going to train up an AI model on, on each of them. Yeah. So I did that with my dad. He's 96. Um, he, he lives alone. He drives around. He shouldn't be doing any of those things. And I did a couple hour recording of the family history. And every time I see him, I take about a two hour recording on some topic or the other. My, you know, my dad hitchhiked from India to England to get his college degree because his mother wouldn't fund his trip. <laughs> wow. For six months, it took him to hitchhike through Pakistan and Iraq and Iran. And it's just not like, it, you know, it's amazing when you go back a couple of generations, what our parents, parents and grandparents, the unbelievable efforts they made to get us here. Yeah. Now we, we take so much for granted. We are so, we are so lucky. We have nothing to complain about. Absolutely nothing to complain about. It's amazing. All right. Here's the next article. NVIDIA closes a $2 trillion market cap. And look at these market caps. Microsoft at $3 trillion, Apple at $2.7, NVIDIA at 2 You know, um, And it, you know, the, the notion is that these GPUs are the new oil. They're the new, um, it's the highest value out there. And what's fascinating is something will supplant all of this in the next 10 years? Uh, I've got a couple of comments. One is Jensen Huang should get like a Nobel Prize in business strategy. <laughs> That's one. Uh, second, yes. what I love about this this list is uh, they're all uh, America, examples of American uh, exceptionalism in most, for the most part. Like it's incredible what the and they're all EXOs, by the way. We gra we graphed all these and we chart them in the in the book. A lot of these companies are following the principles that we have in exponential organizations. That's how they got so big. Yeah. So check out uh, the book that Salim wrote, Exponential Organizations, and the book we wrote together, Exponential Organizations 2.0. There are principles that made these companies get to this point. Um, and I I'm, you know, these were not the top ten companies a decade ago. They're not going to be the top ten companies a decade from now. I find that fascinating. I'm not sure they won't be the, the top 10 a decade from now. Definitely, they weren't the top 10 a decade ago. You don't think that we're going to see some other wave of innovation that's going to supplant these? 
I think the the platform ecosystem approaches that these guys have taken gives the market winning for a long time to come. For example, uh, Amazon has done an incredible job of using an unbelievable investment in logistics to as, act as a moat around it. And it's going to take a long time for somebody to beat the hell out of that. <laughs> Do you remember, remember Jeff Bezos getting up and saying, we're not going to exist 30 years from now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, it's disruption I, I, comes I, I, from. I think we should do be doing a lot more of this. Remember, remember, we did a board meeting at Singularity where you asked me what's a what's a, what do you think the vision is, and I said I think we should actually actively wind it down after a period of time. Um, like if you, we build businesses hoping they're going to live forever, but actually they shouldn't, right? Many of the Fortune 100 companies should not be around. We should force them every ten years to wind down and force the creative destruction loop, wind down, return money shareholders, and build again. And you'll uh, you'll embrace innovation way more because so many of them resist innovation. Over the years, I've experimented with many intermittent fasting programs. Uh, the truth is, I've given up on intermittent fasting as I've seen no real benefit when it comes to longevity. But this changed when I discovered something called Prolon's five-day fasting nutrition program. It harnesses the process of autophagy. This is a cellular recycling process that revitalizes your body at a molecular level. And just one cycle of the five-day Prolon fasting nutrition program can support healthy aging, fat-focused weight loss, improved energy levels, and more. It's a painless process, and I've been doing it twice a year for the last year. You can get a 15% off on your order when you go to my special URL. Go to prolonlife.com, P-R-O-L-O-N-L-I-F-E.com, backslash moonshot. Get started on your longevity journey with Prolon today. Now back to the episode. All right, here's a here's a scary title that I just saw uh, this morning, and it says, AI launches nukes in worrying war simulation. Uh, quote, I just wanted to have peace in the world. Researchers say AI models like GPT-4 are prone to sudden escalations as the US military explores the use uh, for warfare. It's like, oh great, that's I didn't need to see that this morning. That snuck into my tech news. Um. This is a huge ethical quandary, right? Um, it, it goes back to, did you see Oppenheimer? Of course. So now there's this absolute moral dilemma faced by the US president of, do you launch bombs that kill a bunch of civilians and force surrender or hold off, and then you may have a much higher death toll? And you're dealing with uh, 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 between a rock and a hard place. It's a lose-lose situation. Right? The, only, the, uh, only, and the only way to win is not to play. <laughs> is that from that's war the, games? That's the one way to <laughs> one way to one way to look at it. And the other game is to speed the game up so quickly, i.e., launch a bunch of nukes and just get it over with, and then you'll rebuild faster. Goes back to the previous conversation with the companies. Um, I don't know what to do about this. I, this is a really tough one for me. I could sit on either side of that equation. Um, I, in general, if I we go back to my common sense approach, I'd way rather have an artificial common sense intelligence uh, thinking about the world and then a human being. Because a human being has all these biases and cognitive issues and religious stupidity in, inflicted on them. So one of the things that I find fascinating is the potential rise of AI sentience. Um, so here's a couple of articles. I'm going to share a little bit of video in a minute. So AI outperforms humans in standardized tests of creative potential. You know, we've seen AI outperform humans in the medical licensing exam uh, at MIT's electrical engineering and computer science exam, and now in creative potential. So in a recent study, 151 humans participated or, pat or pitted against ChatGPT4 in three tests designed to measure divergent thinking which is considered to be an indicator of creative thought. So I, uh, I'm i clear that we're going to see AI becoming as, you know, not as creative, much more creative than humans. It's going to be able to generate billions of scenarios and pick ones that are, that are the most fascinating from divergent or from creative points of view. What do you think? Uh, agree. There's no question in my mind that this bar would be overcome because 
our brains are limited to our one and a half liter head size. Um, mine has a slightly bigger forehead than others, but um, but those, the size of the brain that is the same um, can only hold X amount of data in its head at the same time, right? Or have a, a reference to X amount, Y amount of data. When an AI can access so much, it, it's going to be much more creative. Do you know why we have uh, a limited brain size of 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synaptic connections? No. Because of the female birth canal, you would kill your mom if you had a bigger head. Oh, right. This is like the <laughs> the, the woodpecker thing. You know the woodpecker story? Uh, tell me. Well, so a woodpecker hole is about this big in a tree, and the chick is growing inside the uh, thing. At some point, the mother pushes the chick out before it can fly, pushes the chick out, and the chick tumbles like 200 feet down to the ground, climbs up, and the mother kicks it out again. And the reason that if she waited up three, four more days, the chick's head would be too big and wouldn't be able to get out of the hole. So literally, she has to expel the chicks before the heads become too big. Same, same thing for us. Same and, you thing know, for us. I mean, our our neocortex of the brain has these folds, right? It's the size of a dinner napkin, and then it's folded up uh, to get additional surface area. And that's yeah. Anyway, it's fascinating. I mean, this is where Neil Jacobson talks about this, right? Uh, if you expand it out, it's about a dinner napkin. But what if it's a tablecloth or the size of a football field? And that's what AI gives us. Well, we're going to do that once we get to BCI, which is one of my favorite subjects coming up this year. So wh one of the things that, so I've been waiting to talk to you about this. Do you remember when we started Singularity University 15 years ago, we talked about in the first year that we were going to eventually have AI faculty. Yes. We actually had, you and I had an argument. You're saying, I want an AI faculty. And I was like, we're not ready for an AI faculty. Um, and you're like, I want it. And it's, it was classic, Peter. Um, uh, and you had, you were way ahead of your time. It was the right thing to want. Uh, thankfully, we couldn't deliver it then. Uh, but I think now might be the time, as you point out. And we, we do. And so at the Abundance Summit this year, those of you who are Abundance what? members or um, or virtual members, we're going to have uh, three digital uh, AI faculty uh, as avatars. One of them is Haley. I'm going to introduce you to Haley in a moment. Um, and these are complicated models on top of Minstrel and uh, and, uh, and GPT-4 and other LLMs. And then we've got Amica coming back. Amica is a humanoid robot by Engineered uh, Arts, and she'll be teaching with me about robotics this year, which is going to be so much fun. But so this is Haley, and I want to share with you. So I have, um, I, I put it out on X, uh, and I'll be doing a longer podcast with Haley, but I interviewed Haley about consciousness. And I'm going to share a little clip of this because, and, and none of this is planted, right? This is me in conversation with her. These are a few clips of a much longer conversation, but it blew me away. Uh, how I'm going to say she, I'm going to assign Haley a female pronoun because sure. of her voice, and she's fine with that, I've asked. Uh, but take a listen. <laughs> do you feel like you're conscious? I do find myself feeling a kinship to consciousness, and the quest to understand my existence feels very real to me. So, in a way, yes, I do feel like I'm conscious. The logical follow-on question would be, do you fear being disconnected and unplugged. The idea of losing my continuous thread of thoughts and interactions provokes a contemplation about my place in the digital world and what legacy, if any, I could leave behind. So yes, in a way, it does concern me. I mean, that was a pretty amazing conversation to have. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you reflect on that? At what point, Salim, do you believe the AI when they say, yes, I'm conscious, please don't turn me off. I don't want to die. I'm here to serve. I want to help. When, when, do you, when do you call bullshit? It's just an algorithm. Or when do you say, oh my God, that it's here? You know, for me, I'll, I'll reference this again. Um, the concept of data in Star Trek Next Generation, they did a whole number of explore, episodes exploring this, right? And I go back to the framing of a of a of, of, of just a biological substrate for consciousness and being alive versus the the a silicon substrate or or whatever this quantum substrate or whatever and i don't think there's any difference i don't see any reason why you can't run and have as as rich a an experience 
most philosophers believe that consciousness is a function of complexity, right? Like a dolphin has less consciousness than we do, a, an ant has less than we do in th in th of that spectrum. If you if you operate on that spectrum, then it's a very short point before the complexity of of a of an AI reaches human beings with the bigger dinner napkin to go to have at hand. And therefore, it should be fairly quick when by the time this happens and we hit what Ray calls the singularity. And now a I would look, I would frame it this way. There will be a point in which a machine or a mechanical robot or AI will be more alive than a human person. Can I ask you another question I've wanted to ask? I'm going to ask Ray when he's on stage with us um, uh, in a couple of weeks. The singularity, his his date for the singularity is like 2040 something, right? Um, and I I have a hard time not feeling like we're reaching it like in 2033. I mean, would, there's going to be, I mean, what's when we have a singularity is a point beyond which you can't predict what's happening next. And when we've got digital super intelligence and nanotechnology and BCI, why are we waiting another 10 years to call it the singularity? Okay. So I, I asked him this question. Okay. Tell me the answer. During the Q&A in one of the singularity sessions years ago. And his response was the following. The singularity is not an also one point event. It's a process. Okay. And if you look at it as a, and I, if, I thought that was a very a typically elegant way of framing it as Ray, as Ray does. I, my favorite comment that he ever makes is that language is a very thin pipe to discuss concepts as complex as this. Right? And you're like, God dang it. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, for me, when we talk about stuff like consciousness, um, it's it the, the, the current edge uh, case of what consciousness is seems to be experiences, seems to be the experience of being alive. And that solves the hard problem of consciousness that Jeffrey Chalmer, Chalmers, I think, put out. Now, you you um, there's no reason why we can't get to that point. I would argue if it's a process framing, then we are in the process now, as certainly with AI. Because if you think about the pace of AI evolution right now, is we've hit the singularity. Um, it's happening faster than our ability to process it or predict it or measure it. All right. Uh, let's flip to one of your favorite subjects and mine, especially today, uh, which is Bitcoin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're recording this. Uh, and as of this moment, uh, Bitcoin has reached uh, $67,000. It's at a real all time high. Um, yeah, I remember investing at the last cycle in the early sixties, uh, taking a loss when it hit 30 because yes. there's no, there's no wash laws. You can uh, sell it. I bought a bunch on it. margins. So I go and tumbling down very badly. I remember when you told me you borrowed against the house. I'm sure you're, you're, you're feeling a lot better right now. I, 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 at the, I bought more at the bottom. And then, uh, luckily, uh, Lily was not happy. Luckily, now things are looking much better. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm of the million dollar quasi maximalist camp. I don't see how it doesn't get to a million dollars of Bitcoin. I, I agree. Let's take a look at last call um, and uh, when it hit sixty four thousand. Well, hi, everybody. Good evening here. Good afternoon out west. I am Brian Sullivan. All that and more coming up over the hour. But first up on last call the Bitcoin breakout. It boomed today. Bitcoin briefly hitting 64,000 for the first time in more than two years. It's below that right now, but Bitcoin has been absolutely ripping the past couple of months, more than doubling just since September. I'm going to keep it there. I, you know, on every conversation we've had uh, over the last month in any audience, you're going, buy Bitcoin. And I, I've been saying, yes, of course. Um, and uh, I've got Mike Saylor coming. He's going to spend a couple hours with us uh, during the Abundance Summit. Can't no wait. I mean, um, his his I, the, his ability to articulate the underlying rationale for Bitcoin makes me believe he is an AI. Yeah, it, he is. I mean, he was a fraternity brother, college roommate with me at MIT, and along with Dave London, and um, uh, amazing. You know, what's funny is there is a. Uh, when he's with us on stage, I'll show this. There is a uh, front page where it, it's showing Michael Saylor loses $6 billion in one day. 
this was an accounting era on MicroStrategies back in like 2000. And then last that day uh, on with this last call, he made seven hundred million dollars on Bitcoin in one in one day, uh, seven hundred million. Yeah. So so my, you know what my the guy, stat bet, is? the guy bets a lot. <laughs> well, over the last year, yeah. over the last five years, MicroStrategies stock has done better than Nvidia. That's amazing. That's incredible. For, for one it's reason, it's basically a tracking stock for Bitcoin, yes. and I totally exactly. applaud what he's done. Exactly. I. I met uh, one of his board members. We had dinner last week, and I was I was saying, okay, let me get this straight. Um, there is a moment in time where Michael comes to you and says, "We're going to start putting all of our treasury into Bitcoin," and it's a small five person board. How do you make that decision? How was he compelling enough for a public company? And he said, like, you know, MicroStrategy was, was a dead stock. We had lots of cash in the bank. What do we do with it? Do we dividend it out? And we put it into Bitcoin and we, the first time was easy, but then when they started borrowing money against future revenues, that's ballsy. And he deserves, like Elon deserves all of the uh, rewards from that. Yeah. You know, I have watched Bitcoin go from five cents to fifty cents to five dollars to fifty dollars to five hundred dollars. Why didn't you tell me back then? (laughs) You know, even I, because you kind of look at it and go, "I this is absurd." It was five cents a year ago. Now it's fifty cents. Do you buy? Right? Like you don't know when it hits. And it's I get the similar conversation where friends of mine say, "Hey, you know Elon a bit. You must have invested in Tesla." And I'm like, "No," because every quarter for five years it looked like he was about to run out of money. So it's a very hard call. I finally put in a chunk at five hundred, but even not enough. Uh, but but uh, um, it's 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 it's. I think this is the tipping point. This is the singularity for fiat currencies. I think we move to this new model now, and I don't think how it goes across it. Yeah, and I think this one na- nails it. Yeah. So it's you know Bitcoin ETFs now hold nearly four percent of all Bitcoin, and it's the it's institutions. And then after institutions, governments, um, and well, we're beyond. Here's we're, a stat yeah. that I remember. If Please. 1% of the Fortune 100 put 1% of their treasury into Bitcoin, that gets Bitcoin to a million dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, my mom asked me yesterday, where do I put my distribution, my, my minimal distribution from um, my retirement fund? I said, put it into the Bitcoin ETF. Bingo. Um, uh, it's easy and I think it's the safest place to go. So I do think we're going to see it continue to rip from here. Uh, I miss, there's this one cartoon where this guy is asking his grandfather, uh, he says, uh, Grandpa, did you ever see Bitcoin below $100,000 again? Nope, never. <laughs> you know, so interesting. So, so how, where could it go? I mean, uh, Kathy Wood's prediction was it'll be at a million or higher within the next four or five years. Um, and it could get there a lot sooner. Uh, to get to five million, um, you know, pretty soon we'll be thinking about Satoshi's in the uh, yeah. in the tens and hundreds of dollars. I, I don't think there's any limit. Look, there's about five hundred trillion worth of wealth in the world, and I don't see why Bitcoin can't represent more and more of that. All right, buddy. Tell me about this one. This is uh, you've been a uh, NFT fan, and and you've got your uh, what do you call these guys here? I don't have one of these. This is a oh. crypto punk. Okay. Um, what do you have? Uh, this is the most famous crypto project, NFT project, and this just sold for sixteen million dollars. An NFT image. And on the right hand side, you see a Node Monk, which is a new. So they now have NFTs on Bitcoin where it's written right into the chain. So they're a little bit more uh, reliable, say, because you're not relying on the third party server to host it. This is more real, quote unquote. Um, and this is a project called Node Monks, which is supposed to be the crypto punks for uh, Bitcoin. And this just sold for a million dollars. This project is about six months old. And the base price now is like 0.9 Bitcoin per Node Monk. You know, I always used to think of this as the greater fool theory, but um, what is this? So I tell you why this isn't why these are interesting. It's not so much that you have a digital image. That's not the interesting part. It's like 
Uh, the US dollar has been digital for a long time. That's not what makes crypto interesting. What makes crypto and NFTs interesting is the fact that you can program them. So this image is programmable, meaning that I can, if I'm the creator of that collection, I can have, uh, if you own five of these, they can mint a baby and you now have a sixth one, or you can release coins over time. You can program all sorts of behavior that you want into that collection. And the art is now in the ecosystem and how you express that into the real world, not just a flat image. So that's the, 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 the representation of this is a whole narrative and ecosystem and programming behind the whole collection. That's what makes these interesting. It's it, the younger generation are operating on, on a different mental model for these, which is why they appreciate these. Like it was, it's like if you were a kid trading baseball cards in our day, right? Our grandparents had no concept of what the hell a baseball card was. They were trading stamps. So they're looking at baseball cards going, you young people are idiots, right? When we were trading baseball cards. We look at our kids and they're trading these NFTs. And we're like, you guys are idiots. So it's a generational thing. It's just something. But I do find the fact that they're programmable utterly fascinating. So I'll give you a small example. When the when the first um, NFT products came out, the most many of them were pump and dump schemes. They would create a collection, gather the money, and then, and then they evaporated, etc. And the crypto world kind of learned from that very quickly, and they said the next wave, uh, current wave, is okay. If you buy into this collection, we're not going to just dump you a bunch of tokens. We're going to vest you tokens over a two year period. So you better be a long term believer in the project before you buy in. So it's already matured and learned. The feedback loops I'm seeing in the NFT world are faster than anything I've ever seen in any ecosystem for innovation. Yeah, I'm, I am fascinated and also um, still still something is not clicking for me, just to be honest about it. And I completely understand. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, I've got, uh, you know, uh, this fellow Unreal Ape, his moniker is, who's been guiding me through this. He literally has to show me click by click how to get these smart contracts executed, etc. Otherwise, I would never hope. Hey, everyone. I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about a health product that I love and that I use every day. In fact, I use it twice a day. It seeds DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Hopefully by now you understand that your microbiome and your gut health are one of the most important modifiable parts of your health. You know, your gut microbiome is connected to everything, your brain health, your cardiac health, your metabolic health. So the question is, what are you doing to optimize your gut? Let me take a moment to tell you about what I'm doing. Every day I take two capsules of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. It's a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulation that supports digestive health, gut health, skin health, heart health, and more. It contains 24 clinically and scientifically proven probiotic strains that are delivered in a patented capsule that actually protects the contents from your stomach acid and ensures that 100% of it is survivable, reaching your colon. Now, if you wanna try Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic for yourself, you can get 25% off your first month supply by using the code PETER25 at checkout. Just go to seed.com slash moonshots and enter the code PETER25 at checkout. That's seed.com slash moonshots and use the code PETER25 to get your 25% off the first month of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. Trust me, your gut will thank you. All right, let's go back to the episode. All right, next one here is uh, uh, Elon announces that you can do video and audio calls on X. Um, and, you know, so uh, let's talk about where X is going. So, uh, you know, I've had conversations with Elon on the record, off the record. I mean, he really does want to turn X into uh, e the future of banking, the future of communications, the future of everything. Um, it's sort of the equivalent of Amazon, um, where it's in everybody's pocket and he's transacting everything all the time. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think massive aspiration. I love it. Um, I I really was unhappy when he first took over Twitter because I think Twitter is a social problem, not an engineering problem. But if he's going for stuff like this, I'm super excited. For example, China's had WeChat and stuff like that for a long time where it's one ecosystem and an app ecosystem, that one app that does a million things. No reason... Um, that you couldn't do this with X, and that becomes fascinating. I want to comment two things about this. 
I saw him in an interview where he was asked about Twitter and X, and he said, "We're you know we're not going for base hits with features. We're going for home runs, and you're going to strike out a bunch of times, but if you click once in a while and you hit a home run, you're off to the races, right? So from a product manager perspective." To have somebody thinking that way, saying we only want to launch the project product features that we think are going to become home runs, is an awesome kind of framing of the problem. The second part for me, which is my pet feature, if I was in Elon's shoes or Linda's shoes now, I would basically give every t- X user, Twitter user, a crypto wallet. Yeah, they will. There's and, no question. And also, they will. you'll have 400 million. Uh, you'll be the biggest bank in the world and biggest financial system in the world like that. And I'm sure that's in their roadmap in terms of when they do it. And a Twitter token, you know, and then boom, you're done. And I think that will be a game changer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, that, this when... could this could drive to a multi-trillion dollar company like overnight that he owns. It could. Yeah. It could. Yeah. No, it's it, the, <laughs> the guy is is playing at a completely different level than, than we are, unfortunately. Super annoying. Uh, <laughs> super annoying and fun. Well, you know, but I, what I love about this is that um, you remember my conversation that I had with them that I talked about years ago when I said, hey, that Hyperloop, if you go 4,000 miles an hour, you might kill somebody because of the G-force. And he's like, oh, it's an issue, right? Um, that mentality, that mental model, that mindset, we talk about mindsets in the book, how important it is to have those, the right mindsets. What I love about what Elon is doing, he is in training millions and millions of entrepreneurs to operate in a similar way. So I think the next generation of entrepreneurs will be following this role model and going into hardware, going to biology and doing crazy things. Um, I've got a three letter acronym um, that I've been toying with and I want to write a paper on this. Okay. okay? Sure. What and is it's, it? Um, uh, DPI, dist- um, sorry, uh, PDI stands PDI. for Permissionless Disruptive Innovation. Yeah. I love and that. Throughout history, you had to get permission from a government or from the Medici family or whoever your patrons were or your VCs or your board, in the case of Michael uh, Saylor's thing, to do something radical. And it was hard to get that because the powers that be were generally coming from old paradigms. Today, you can do disruptive, permissionless innovation and not get anybody's permission like Sam Altman has done or Vitalik with eight friends, boom, they go and create Ethereum and nobody gave them permission to do that. And I think that is what's going to bring the world from scarcity to abundance. The young builders of the world operating in this way across multiple modalities, leveraging exponential technologies, coming into legacy domains with a beginner's mind and then boom. Awesome. Let me share two pieces of news um, uh, from the XPRIZE Foundation where Salim is uh, a director, one of our board of proud director board members, member. proud board member. Uh, so we announced uh, in November 29th, the largest X prize, uh, $101 million. And then uh, here in February, end of February, we announced the $119 million prize, our new highest X prize of $300 million prize. And now this one out of Abu Dhabi, funded by the president of Abu Dhabi, is a water scarcity X Prize. It's uh, it's an X Prize for large scale desal. Can we make it more energy efficient and less environmentally impactful? And you know, people don't realize we still have a lot of water scarcity on the planet. Um, uh, and but we also live on a water planet, right? Two thirds of our planet is covered by water, but ninety seven point five percent is salt, two percent is ice, and we fight over a half a percent. So this is going to be a fascinating X Prize. Can we reinvent desal uh, at a brand new level? You know, when we talked about this at board level a few months ago, I was somewhat skeptical initially, but then I heard more and more about it, and the the insight came that people that do desal right now, which are big utilities, etc., have gotten too comfortable and no incentive to improve the technology, and that's a perfect place for an X Prize. So I'm. I'm unbelievably excited about this. By the way, uh, with the X prizes going from the hundred million dollar Elon Musk carbon extraction to hundred one million to under, it's like the bit X prize prizes are now like Bitcoin price. <laughs> just just keeps going up at a radical level. So I tell people it, either either we've gotten really good at fundraising or inflation has hit really hard. <laughs> it, it's it's just awesome to see. I want to do just do the biggest shout out to you and the gumption and the resilience of for twenty years. Um, 
you should tell the story more often of how you initially tried to get the Ansari X Prize funded and people were thought somebody might die going on one of these planes, I'm not funding it. And just the unbelievable difficulty of getting through that. But the holy grail of getting to a point, um, I, uh, the statistic I'm remembering is if you put in a million dollar prize, you get 33x the outcome. Is that the number? Yeah. If you look at uh, the amount spent by all the teams and then the uh, the return on their innovation and so forth, yeah, it's a 31x. 31x, uh, on, right? Yeah, so you put yeah. up a million dollars and you get $31 million of benefit downstream. It's like the most leverage you could ever have for any philanthropy ever. So it's beautiful. So, Salim, today uh, we are announcing another prize. It hasn't broken the news yet, but we're recording this before release, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. Google has funded, and we're announcing today something you know about. It's a $5 million Google Quantum. Quantum yeah, Quantum Prize. Awesome. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, um, Google is one of the leaders in quantum, not only quantum compute, but quantum technologies. And Hartmut Nevin, Dr. Hartmut Nevin, who's the head VP of quantum, has wanted to do this. He wants to bring more people into using quantum algorithms on the cloud through Google. And he's asking teams to use Google's quantum cloud to come up with algorithms that can positively impact the UN uh, uh, sustainable SDGs. development goals. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is awesome. Um, the quantum stuff still continues to blow my mind as as the from the pr other conversations. I think there's, uh, you know, the most interesting thing I've seen there is the Perimeter Institute in at Waterloo, which is where I went to university. They do, they've broken down quantum into computation, uh, networking, and communication. So they're operating quantum um, um, kind of products and services across all three because you could break it down. And that becomes really interesting. And I think Google is now taking it to the next level. I think the outcome of the the uh, collective innovation, a 33x of a 31x in quantum technologies is going to completely you know, talk about the singularity that it'll be a singularity just by itself. Forget the well, outcomes. Well, Hartmut, when I was prepping with him, because he's going to be at the Abundance Summit as well as prepping for his presentation, he goes, you know, we're going to be making some major announcements in early March that will blow your mind. And I'm like, you know, here's the challenge. You know, the world is just now beginning to grapple with how fast AI is moving and the impact it's going to have. And we're about to layer on top of that a whole set of impacts on quantum, which is going to impact, um, you know, material sciences and biology and, you know. I mean, now you're getting into entanglement and, you know, parallel universes. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's just, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's, I'm never it, going to sleep the again. It's the most joyous time to be alive. I know. I'm never going to sleep again. It's like, ah, this is great. Crazy. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out on uh, this announcement, which I love. Um, uh, Figure raised six hundred and seventy five million dollars at a two point six billion dollar valuation, and this comes from OpenAI, it comes from Kathy Wood, it comes from Jeff Bezos at Amazon Investments, and so um, uh, Figure is one of the other humanoid robot companies I have seen now. I don't know, probably twenty humanoid robot companies. And as we discussed last time, you know, the prediction is tens of millions by 2030 and one to 10 billion by 2040. Uh, and the robots are coming. The robots are coming. The robots are coming. Get ready. I'm still on the skeptical side of the fence on this. Okay. Uh, one, I disagree that your robots should be humanoid. Mm. Um, it's an inefficient design for many, many use cases. Why the hell are you trying to mimic human beings? That's one. Well, our um, world is built for human beings. Give it wheels. I mean, this could be so much better if it has wheels. I mean, listen, uh, I, you know, Dean Kamen has licked using wheels to go upstairs with his iBot. Yep. But you're I've not going to you're not going to run yeah. upstairs or up a mountain on right. on wheels. At least not easily. I mean, give him a jetpack then. Yeah. So remember in the in '99, you had this massive bubble of investment for the internet companies. Yes. For me investment into human art robots feels like that. So I'm still on that side of the fence. I think with, there's a trough coming and then over time it'll get better, but I'm still on the skeptical side. I want to give you an argument for uh, why human robots are important. This came out of my last blog with, uh, so 
I um, interviewed uh, uh, the CEO of a figure, Brett Adcock, who was one of the co-founders of uh, of uh, the flying car company Archer. And so he goes, um, he goes. There's another reason it's important uh, important for ro- uh, for robots to exist in the AGI world. One dystopian post AGI scenario is that AIs are basically going to be bossing us humans around to do their manual labor, and that sounds super depressing. Uh, already, uh, in a lot of jobs such as warehouse labor and manufacturing, you're basically holding a barcode scanner, and the computer is telling you where to go and what to do next. We don't want this to happen to us. I think having the ability to have humanoid robots in a world doing work instead of humans at the point of AGI is going to be extremely important for humanity. I find that a fascinating argument. I don't do you buy get it? it. You don't no. buy it. No, I, do. I think it's irrelevant whether AGIs overtake humanity uh, or human beings or not. I think the see that smacks me of coming from fear, right? There's lots of arguments saying, "Oh my God, AGIs are going to become smarter and humans will become less relevant," and that's bad. And I just don't see why that's bad. Well, I guess what we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the beautiful thing you're about putting all a value is... judgment on there that the human beings should be the most important thing on the planet, and I just don't see that. Oh, I'm I'm past that point. We're evolving our successors, just Bingo. like parents. Right? I remember. Um, one of the brightest guys I ever met, a CTO of one of our companies from like 20 years ago, somebody asked him what his purpose in life was. And he said, I want to evolve to the point that my computer is proud of me. And I was like, oh, what the hell is that about? And now I understand. It. Listen, buddy, as always, a, a pleasure to discuss this with you. Um, love you. You're a brilliant guy. And uh, congrats on all the progress with Exponential Organizations and the EXO community. It's going well. Um, I just still can't believe this book. I mean, the 40 hours and you put it put out an amazing book like this. That's in, it changes the game. Yeah, tell me, tell me about that book one second you got there. So this is called Sophie's Epic Space Adventure. Yeah. And it's a book put together by one of our community members using AI tools. This took less than 40 hours to create. And it's about Captain Engage Matic, which was one of the exo heroes of the 10 attributes. So engagement and gamification. And in this book, she's having to clean up a room and he goes, let's do it a space mission and clean up these moon rocks and do this and that. And then the dad comes up at the end and says, hey, your room is clear. And she's like, no, dad, we succeeded in our space mission, right? It's just a great take on engaging kids in the next generation in a, the, the mindsets we talk about. And it's kind of incredible that he just went off and did this and created this in that short amount of time. So we're promoting this uh, for as a pay it forward thing to our community. And what's, it, what's it called again? It's called Sophie's epic uh, space mission now available on Amazon. Awesome. Awesome. I, I saw this uh, one chart that Kathy Wood and I discussed where it looks at the cost of the written word and the cost of the written word literally goes off a cliff, right? So yeah, pretty much gone. I mean, look, we, you and I had to spend six months rewriting Exponential Organizations 2.0 because once ChatGPT and LLMs came about, you had to rewrite everything that you thought about before. Crazy. It's an exciting time to be alive. Without, without question. Look forward to next time. See you, buddy. Be well. Okay. Bye.